Hi guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho. For those of you that don't know me, I am a nutritional therapist and I work with clients to get them to root cause healing. I also focus on gut health and using a meat-based elimination diet as a healing protocol. If you find this episode helpful, please make sure to subscribe, like this video, review on podcast platforms so that we can get this message out. And for those of you on YouTube, you may have noticed that this is a little different where there is no video this time. I hope you still follow this episode as there is so much important information through this talk. So I had the pleasure of interviewing Lynn Farrow. Lynn Farrow is a journalist, researcher, former college professor and speaker. Her own experience with breast cancer led her to the discovery that there's a lot of misinformation around iodine and that someone had stolen a medicine with proven benefits that reached back even 15,000 years. Lynn currently serves as the Director of Breast Cancer Choices, a nonprofit organization dedicated to scrutinizing and reporting of the evidence for breast cancer procedures and treatments. Lynn is also the editor of iodineresearch.com, where she compiles materials for iodine investigators. From obscure studies on iodine in the brain to pieces for the beginner looking for an iodine protocol. And again, I will share all these links and the links we talk about in the discussion in the show notes. In Lynn's book, The Iodine Crisis, Lynn explains how environmental pollutants has caused an iodine deficiency and it's become a worldwide epidemic. We also think that we can get our iodine from iodized salt. In our discussion, we will talk a little bit more about this, but the government has added iodine to our salts in case of iodine deficiency. Lynn goes into the discussion how it's a nutritional scam and provides a false sense of security when we're in fact still iodine deficient. Lynn's book, The Iodine Crisis, explains how we become so deficient and that how we can reverse so many of our conditions by adding iodine and possibly some of the nutrient companions or cofactors while supplementing iodine. All right, guys, I am very excited for you to listen to this interview. It was very eye-opening, and just like so much misinformation is part of eating meat, we will also see some information that we need to debunk around iodine and thyroid health. Let's get right into the interview. Um, Hi, Lynn. How's it going? Fine. I'm eager to have a talk. Yes, thank you so much for joining me today. So, um, you know, for those um, of the listeners, the audience that don't know you, if you could share your story and how you stumbled upon iodine and, you know, the whole relationship with breast cancer and iodine. Okay. Um, I'm an an expert on iodine. I sort of became this accidentally when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I went around to different medical conferences trying to figure out what was the right thing to do and different doctors. And I found that a lot of the treatments out there, there wasn't enough evidence uh, that was completely persuasive. So at at one of these medical conferences, I ran across a a doctor who told me something about iodine. And I thought this was crazy because I had already researched every possible therapy for iodine conventional and not conventional, or as I say, non-standard. And the person who told me this, the doctor who told me this said, oh, you, you, you really have to look into it. And she gave me some anecdotes about her patients. And then when I went home, I, I thought, you know, well, I've been a researcher. I've been a professor. I've gone to graduate school. I know how to read this literature, so I'll just give it two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, I realized I hadn't, you know, scratched the surface. So I gave it two months. And then I was so persuaded about the information out there about iodine, not just with the breast, but with other organs and other conditions in the body, that um, I just did a huge amount of research for a couple of years, and I stopped a project that I was working on just to do this. And um, one of the things I I found out is that there's a lot of misinformation out there about iodine, and one of the things is, is is that it can shut down the thyroid gland, which isn't exactly true. Uh, sometimes when you give people iodine, 
in the first 48 hours, the thyroid may have to adjust and it, may, it might go slightly hyper for 48 hours, but that's a, a very small uh, uh, side effect and it's, it's transient. Right. And that's what they call, this was discovered and uh, written about in 1948. That's called the wolf Chaikoff effect, which uh, my mentors in the iodine movement have, have exhaustively disproved. And so the Chinese have disproved it as well about the same time, but uh, nobody uh, paid that much attention to it because the wolf Chaikoff people were associated with uh, the NIH here in, in the States. Based on that assumption, um, that wolf Chaikoff assumption, they say that iodine shuts down thyroid glands. So are you saying that it does not shut down the thyroid? other than that 48 hour, maybe hyper, you know, thyroid kind of symptom? Well, actually, uh, Wolf and Chaikoff only did it with uh, rats right. <laughs> or rodents. So, and, and, and then when they found out that it didn't shut down the, sh the, the, the thyroid of the rodents, they called, they said, oh, well, it escaped the Wolf Chaikoff effect. Well, it didn't escape it. There was no Wolf Chaikoff effect to begin with. But anyway, because this person was a very well-known academic and, and scientist, it, it, it became a prevalent theory and is, is ta was taught in medical schools then and is still taught in medical schools. So we're going through the process of, of, of trying to have people relearn about how the thyroid works with respect to iodine. Okay, can we talk a little bit about that? And, um, and then secondly, is it then even possible to overdose on iodine? Like, is there such a thing as like a max dosage that we should be taking of iodine? There's not, there's not really a, 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 an iodine poison. Okay. Dose. I'm, I'm sure if you took enough of it, you could probably, okay. I mean, like quarts of it or something, it, you could probably get very sick. Um, but what happens when people that take it, people have a, a way of doing this. They, read something on the internet, f pick out a product at their health food store or on, net, on the net, and they come home and they just take it without any directions, without ever having any understanding that iodine competes with bromide, which our body is loaded with. And when you take iodine, that competition pushes bromide into the blood bloodstream. And bromide is, is can make you uh, is sick. I go over that in my book. I wrote a book called The Iodine Crisis, What You Don't Know About Iodine Can Wreck Your Life, because it did wreck my life for a long time, uh, having an iodine deficiency. And what I tell people about how where I started, be, even before I had bre breast cancer was like the last thing I got. Before that, I had been teaching full time and I was getting so tired. I would just drag myself there. I was sleeping all the time. I had constant headaches. I was taking painkillers and coffee to keep going. And there's a lot of people like me out there. Right. And finally, I, 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 I left and I worked as a journalist part-time because I could regulate my hours more. And then after that, a couple of years, I got uh, breast cancer. So that got me interested. And when I started taking the iodine, the brain fog I had that I'd had for years, uh, which I'd lost my license, my driver's license, because I would just vague out and I would go through stop sign wow. and or I'd just like run off the road a little bit. And, and the first day, I, there's an iodine test you can take and you have to take 50 milligrams of iodine to take the 24 hour urine test. So I didn't know anything really how it worked on myself. Uh, or, you know, on people, any other person, because this was a long time ago. This was in, in, in 2004. And what happened was within an hour and a half, all that brain fog just like cleared. I was suddenly alert and I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, is this the thyroid? Is this a neurological thing? I d didn't really know, but I knew that this was something that I really had to uh, experiment with and, and talk to other people about. So that's one of the things, and, and to, to answer your question, so I felt great a couple of days uh, taking this, and then the bromide hit, and we didn't really know about that, that then, and I, I did some research, and I found out there's like a, a bromide dominance effect. If bromide dominates, you're more likely to get headaches and thyroid and weight gain and stuff like that, and when iodine pushes out the bromide, you're, you're you're, you're much better.
And the thing is, we, the, our whole country, and, and like most of the Western world, has an iodine deficiency. And the, how we know this is because there's a government program called Nahanes, N-A-H-N-A-E-S, and if they looked at the iodine saturation from people's urine um, in 1970, and between 1970 and 1920, the iodine in our bodies dropped 50%. So what ha we found out what happened around that time is like a perfect storm. Uh, one iodine was taken out of the bread. It was an additive to make the dough fluffy. And that was taken out of the bread and it was replaced with bromide, which is the anti-iodine. So if you want to cause an iodine deficiency, one, take the main peak way people get their iodine and two, replace it with an anti-iodine. So uh, I hope you're following this. I hope it isn't like too crazy sounding, but it, it's true. This is what happened. So we have this iodine deficiency coming in in the 70s. At the same time is bromide being used as a mass, like a pesticide, a fungicide. It, it, it was used for fire retardants. That's, that's probably the biggest exposure that we have now. Uh, the, you know, if you go to a hotel, the carpets have had bromide on them and... Uh, even baby toys and children's pajamas had. I, I have pictures of these in my book. So 1970, and then the, the increase of, of breast cancer, breast cancer goes up from 1 in 28 to like 1 in 7 or 8 if, by, by, um, by 2000. So I was in this sort of rush of people that were all, I was in that generation, and, and I guess women still, all women still are right now, that got the burden of the bromide and the, the bromide dominance and the iodine deficiency all coming in at the same time. So that was a kind of perfect storm. The prevalence of hypothyroid now is really related to this iodine deficiency and excess in bromide. Yes, it is. It, the uh, I def more people are hypothyroid now, especially women, yeah. because women need more iodine because they have ovaries and breasts. So they're more likely to be hypothyroid. But also thyroid cancer uh, has gone up. And I, I did the research on this at the National Cancer Institute, and I, they have all sorts of graphs and charts and figures. So I called the head guy down there, and there's a PhD. He just has statistics. And I said, I want to make sure I'm doing the math on this right. I said, did, did thyroid cancer increase 80% between uh, 1970 and 2000? And he said, no, you did the math a little wrong. You have to add 100, to, 100 points to that. That's the way we multiply it in, in the statistical world. So, and he, he was sort of, eyes were popping. He said, you know, I never really noticed this. So even in the cancer, the st statistics world, they hadn't noticed that the rate of thyroid disease had gone up 180% in, in, wow. this, uh, in this uh, sure. few years. And so that's, that's like an, an end stage disease. I mean, that's you know, like the worst case scenario is getting thyroid disease, though it's not a, a bad cancer to get as cancers go, but it's still, you don't want to have it. Um, but if you don't get, you know, thyroid cancer, obviously there's all sorts of other things that could go wrong with your thyroid as well. And iodine it, you know, is part of the, of the thyroid hormone complex. If you're not getting thyroid, uh, you know, you're not getting iodine your thyroid is starving and you're starving your breasts and your brain and don't forget that uh, iodine deficiency is the leading cause of mental retardation in the world so we have that going on as well let's take a step back and talk about because in your book you talk about the difference between iodine and iodide and how different parts of the body need um, the different forms do you think you could talk a little bit about that yeah the general um, thing you, that we have to know is that the the breasts and the ovaries, uh, in particular, uh, like uh, elemental iodine, which is called I2. That's the element of iodine. Whereas the thyroid prefers iodide, which is the salt of iodine. That's all you need to remember. They do sell, I mean, Lugol solution, the one that combines iodine and iodide, that's been for sale like for over 200 years. And it, it was used in Europe. It was invented in France during... Uh, the Napoleon's revolution. They thought they were making gunpowder and they accidentally discovered uh, the element of iodine. But 
it, and it, it took off. I mean, it immediately took off in France and it you know, jumped the channel. So the English were very, very uh, keen on it. And were, there was a lot of goiter there. So they were um, working on their thyroids. And the breast surgeons even in England in the early 1800s, in the 1830s, were using iodine as, as a treatment. So to, to answer your question, that's the difference between iodine and iodide. Uh, for your thyroid, you really have to know about iodide. So, and, and it's, it's really hard to get iodine specifically unless you get it in Lugol's or there's a product out there called Violet. It, it's just come out in the last 10 years. They used a lot of the stuff from my book uh, in their advertising promotion, but that's another thing. Uh, one of the things that, that the Violet product does, it's exclusively iodine. It's, it's chemically altered in a certain way and it, its only use is, it, that, that it's sold for is to keep breast pain down, to reduce breast pain. People think they're taking some kind of magical breast painkiller, but they're not. They're, they're taking a nutrition solution. And there, there's a lot of work that's now being done with uh, breast cancer in which they're, this is going to take a long time, but they've been at it now 10 years. They're adding it to conventional therapies and getting much better results. So in other words, mm -hmm. if, if there's a whole, uh, there's a whole protocol uh, that's in the pipeline now, it'll probably be another 10 years before it's automatically, you know, if you go to a, a breast doctor when you have cancer or something, they'll probably automatically go. But that'll be a time from now. And meanwhile, lots of people have uh, breast cancer, so it's good to know. Um, you also mentioned that there's ways to check for our iodine insufficiency or deficiency in, in the body. Do you, can you talk a little bit about that and you know where can we get tested for that 24-hour test? Yes. Um, Hakala Labs is a good place. That's Hakala. Uh, you could just look it up on the internet. There's a 24-hour urine test, which means you take 50 milligrams of iodine in the morning and then you collect the urine throughout the day and you put it in a jug and then you send a sample of that jug to the Hakala labs and they will tell you how deficient you are or not deficient and most people are deficient in it. So that's the only test. The blood tests are not accurate uh, because of what they do is they measured the average iodine content mm -hmm. and the average iodine content is very low. So if you're normal, on that kind of test or any other test than the 24 hour. There's other people that dry the urine and all sorts of magic stuff. The only thing that works is, is that I find in my experience of all these years is the iodine loading test. That's the, the, the gold standard. Well, in the States, it looks like the most common one is the 2% Lugol's. Do you know how many drops that is that would be equivalent to 50 milligrams? I'm not yeah. exactly sure. I'd have to look in my book. There's a chart in my book yeah. from every kind of drop from 2%, 5%, 10%, 12%. So you can just, so, but always measure by the milligrams, not by the drops. Because if you, if you were talking to somebody who had 12% and you were taking 2%, it would be totally, you'd be talking at cross purposes. The most important thing I, I, I wanted to talk to you about because of what we had discussed when we were corresponding is you don't take iodine alone. You absolutely don't for two reasons. One, you have to take the selenium because you don't want to like shock your body and have a small chance of uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune thing. The chances of you getting it are low, but you don't want to get it anyway. So you have to take the companion nutrient. So selenium is one of those. And after a while, you might not need as much. You have to you know, work with an iodine literate uh, practitioner or, or somebody who knows about this and knows it, that there's a protocol involved and sort of could like take you trial and error through this if you have any trouble. Um, in your book, you talk about if you have excess bromide or if you're just not feeling well that you may want to salt load, um, there's the selenium. And I thought in the book, I thought it said, if you're hypothyroid, maybe if you have Hashimoto's, then the selenium is um, much more needed than if it's maybe just the average person that's wanting to increase their iodine. So is that correct? Or should everybody be taking selenium with the iodine? Above and apart from that, I run a, a breast cancer nonprofit, and we have different protocols and, and research that we've done. And before I knew anything about iodine, selenium is right up there on an anti-breast cancer protocol. And before there was even the breast information, there was a study done, a double blind study, which means one group gets the placebo and, and one gets the selenium. And it was supposed to go out five years. You were supposed to like check in after five years and, and 
you have a whole list of cancers to see whether you got them or not. Well, after two years, they had to cancel because ethically you have to cancel if it's clear that one side of the trial uh, is doing better than the other. So many l more people in the non-selenium, in the placebo group, got in di various different types of cancers, not skin cancer, but a lot of different other cancers, that they just stopped it completely and published the results. So even if you didn't have anything to do with iodine, uh, I would be sure to take some selenium, certainly, maybe if you don't take it every day, but it, it, certainly take it so you're adequate and not deficient. But the main thing that you started to say, and, and, and some of your clients may have gotten into this trouble, they don't understand that when you're taking iodine, besides taking it, and even if you take the companion nutrients, you know, to the letter, as I've spelled it out in the book, you have to consider the salt loading protocol. That's really important because you're loading your body with iodine, which is fine, you're gonna feel the pickup, but then you're also gonna purge the bromide. Not everybody feels it. You may have it and not feel it. You may have the bromide gushing into your bloodstream, being displaced. Uh, so you take this salt water drink that's, that's been around for years, so you can just look it up in my book and it shows you how to take uh, the salt water to, to get rid of, and sometimes it's like magic. It can work in half an hour, 45 minutes to get rid of any sort of yucky, feeling you might have of the brain fog and stuff. Now, when soldiers had too much bromide, during the Gulf War, soldiers were giving bromide injections for some germ warfare or something. Uh, they would get too much bromide and some of them would be playing ping pong in the, in the rec room, the soldiers that have too much bromide and the others would be crying on their bunks because they would be so depressed. So, and then in mental hospitals in the 50s when they gave out bromide a lot for digestive reasons, uh, people checked into mental hospitals and they'd find out that a lot of them were high in bromide because they had been taking too much bromo seltzer or something like that. This is my way of, of, of just warning everybody. Please just be mindful that salt water is a really a helpful thing. And, and the dilution is, is such that it should not increase your sodium content because you're taking enough uh, water that it just sort of washes out the excess sodium. But 99% of the people. I know that this salt protocol basically needs salt. And I know a lot of people also think, well, I consume regular iodized salt, so I'm getting my iodine. And I know in your book, you talk about how that's not true. Can we get a little bit into that? You know, what happens to the salt as soon as it's processed and how some of the iodine is removed or lost? Well, if you, if the salt is put in at the factory, say Morton salt or something like that. And then it has to be shipped on trucks to your local supermarket. And during that time, it loses a huge percentage of, of the, the iodization. It, uh, for lack of a better word, it evaporates into the air. It, it, it doesn't, that isn't the exact technical word, but that's what happens. So they lose it in the air. Then you get it at your local supermarket, the Morton's, and you take it home and put it in your cabinet. And then you open it. So there's, there's a little bit of iodine in there when you open it. Within two weeks, most of that iodine is floating around your kitchen. There's a little bit, but nothing in the way of a, a therapeutic amount. It, it may be enough to, ca have ca to help people with goiter in the 1930s, iodized salt. But now we are way past. We're like in a post-goiter thing. There's, there's a huge iodine deficiency that is not fixed by iodized salt. So you would never recommend the iodized salt um, and you recommend the... No, I, well, I don't... I, I wouldn't recommend iodized salt as, a, as it is not a, an iodine supplement at all. The iodine is in your kitchen. That It's floating in the air. That's where it goes. And if you cook it, if, if you happen to like throw it in a, a, a bowl, a, a pot of stew, it will go into the air. It will, it, it will cook away. Right, right. And you also mentioned um, all the other toxic components about iodized salt too, right? How it's bleached and... I mean, right. just they use caking aid. Yes. Caking and bleach and well sometimes there's even sugar and salt but um yes i don't recommend it i don't have it in the house but i use celtic salt uh, but there's a lot of other all you need is unprocessed salt i like celtic salt because it tastes so tastes like wine almost it's very tasty but as long as it's unprocessed meaning unbleached you know no caking agents when it just says unprocessed salt on the label 
when I want to wake up, if I'm out late for some reason and I'm starting to get sleepy, I just take a little salt and I, it, it picks me up because I think that just boosts your adrenal glands in a temporary way. Um, but that's not the iodine, that's the sodium. From the perspective of iodine, so, you know, we talked about how some people that are really deficient in iodine, if they start using it, uh, they may feel some of the symptoms of the hyperthyroid. I, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think it's called the post-scarcity effect. Oh, the post scarcity effect. What happens is some people are so iodine deficient. It's like one of the doctors said they're going on fumes. The post scarcity effect, if, if say your thyroid is very deficient in iodine, it, when you start taking iodine, it might swell up because your iodine is so like uh, your body wants to hoard it because the, don't forget the function of the thyroid is to trap iodine well one of the functions is to trap iodine from your bloodstream so when your thyroid sees this influx of iodine come in it, it starts to swell just like you would if you were in a, a ter you know a third world country and got goiter if you when your body sees iodine it wants to make the most efficient use to it so it it hoards it swells a little bit and hoards the iodine because your body because it's post-scarcity, it does not realize that it's going to have a steady stream of nutritionally adequate iodine now. Now, this also happens in the breast. It can happen in the breast. Now, this is a small percentage of people, but enough that it's significant to note as a post-scarcity effect. Some people will start taking iodine and will say, hey, I, didn't I just take iodine because my breasts were sore? Why are they swelling? Well, they'll go down once you're once your breasts are convinced that the, there's a steady diet of iodine coming. Does that answer your yes. question? Like how long does that post-scarcity effect last for people that do experience it? Uh, not very long. And one of the things you can do if, it, if it's uncomfortable, just slow down on what you're taking. So your body will just hoard less. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with bromide. It just has okay. to do with deficiency. Let's talk a little bit about bromide. So you just talked about that. If you can talk about you know, where we can find bromide. And, and the other question is, so if we don't eat foods that have bromide, are we still, do we still have a high chance of being iodine deficient? Yes, because you know, I've had people say to me, oh, I don't need iodine because I don't have any bromide problem. I, I've eaten perfectly clear for the last 10 years. Well, you know, have you gone on a plane? Do you drive a car that has carpet in it? You know, are, are you, have you ever been in a library where they have upholstery? Have you been in a hotel? All these things have fire retardants in it and you inhale them. And you could actually, you can find that one of the biggest sources of bromide is the bromide fire retardant dust. It breaks down in pillows and stuff. It breaks down and it gets on your floor and your dog gets it and you get it. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's a serious thing. It used to be in uh, cell phones. I think we've, we've hounded them enough uh, that they, they've taken it out of cell phones. They may have put something else in, but at least the bromide isn't. And I also saw that it was in some sodas and juices, right? So it's in Mountain Dew. Um, I think the BVO. They haven't taken it out of, of, of Mountain Dew. Uh, I think it was a teenager who got it taken out of uh, Gatorade or, or some other, some, some drinks. She just started a, an online project and she hounded them until they got rid of, uh, of the bromide. But Mountain Dew is particularly bad. You know, what's interesting. I, um, so I wrote a book not too long ago and I brought up certain additives that are starting to get banned in, in our country. And then how there are some additives that are allowed in our country, but they're banned in most other countries. And one of them I saw was the BVO. I didn't realize this. It was the kind of antagonist to iodine. I, didn't know that at the time. And so I brought up Mountain Dew in the book um, because of it and, um, and how toxic oh, good. and how toxic it is. But I didn't bring up iodine, which I really regret. So I think the second edition, I'll definitely include it. But what I'm hearing from you is that almost everyone is deficient in iodine. And so we should all kind of supplement. Um, there's not really a chance to overdose on iodine. Um, would you say that's a correct statement? It's very hard because you're starting low and going slow. That, that's sort of my motto is, you know, you start with a small amount and, and, and you work up to where you're getting results. If breast pain is, is something, if it, you're hypothyroid and you're gaining weight and stuff like that, it, you need to get your thyroid sort of normalizing all the glands. That What iodine is, is an adaptive in other words, it works on many things at the same time. When, and you think about where iodine used to come from, it was seaweed. It was like the beginning of the earth when the water covered it. I, seaweed was there. 
So it works interacting way. That's why iodine works on so many things. And in the 1800s, it was called the universal nutrient because right. they would give it to somebody that had a flu or something and it would help. And they'd give it to somebody who had cysts on their waist or cysts on their wrists. And for some reason, it would work. So they just throw iodine at everything. And there, there are so many books on iodine in the 1900s, and I have half of them here in my office. Uh, most of them smell a little moldy because I had to get them from sales and old book dealers and stuff like that. But there's, there's a huge amount of, of knowledge, of old knowledge out there that, you know, my goal in life is to recycle what people knew about iodine 100 years ago. In your book, I see the 50 milligrams thrown around a lot, and maybe it's also because of the testing. And then some of the discussions say start with 12 and a half. If it's really bad, like if your bromide kind of detox is really bad, maybe you pulse by taking two days off so that the kidneys kind of get a break with the detoxing. The drops, um, I think the calculation comes out to six to eight drops for the 2% is around 50. But I, I, I mean, I don't want the listeners to quote me on that because I don't know for sure. But is there a product that you recommend that is the 50 milligrams or the 12 and a half milligrams? Or is it the drops that you're recommending? Oh, well, there's a, there's a tablet. Um, Iodorol is one of the tablets. And that was manufactured by, it wouldn't get any stomach upset because years ago when people would take iodine in their stomach, you know, maybe 10% of them would take a lot and they would bother their stomach. So Dr. Abraham put it in a tablet and the tablets were 12 and a half milligrams. And that was a really usable dose for most people. Okay. But then he also made the 50 milligrams, which I had this discussion with him. And I said, you know, most people just cannot start with 50 milligrams. And he said, oh, well, all the people I know can. Well, the people I know didn't, weren't able to start with 50 milligrams. So, uh, you know, we tried to like scale that down a little bit to have people start low and, and work up to what, what helps them. There are people that take 100. You know, there are people right. that take more than that because they, they seem to think that more than that. There's no evidence that taking 200 or something like that works, but they're taking it and, you know, you can't argue with success. There's also people who have, have oh, there's one person on, on uh, our internet group. She was have, Her husband was chopping her meat for her, slicing her meat for her because she was so tired. She thought she was getting dementia. She was like 40. She thought she was getting dementia from brain fog. And she started with iodine and she, she does well, I think, with something like 25 a week, you know, like broken down because she's worked herself up wow. and, 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 and seems to be doing well. So you may be one of those people who can get along. If you know what's wrong with you, if you know you're depressed, sluggish, your eyes are puffy, uh, you're falling asleep, you're cold. That's to me was the hallmark because when I took iodine, I was never cold again. <laughs> So, you, you know, you really need to keep taking it because it's a hormone. So you need it all the time. I mean, it, it works on the hormones. It's not a hormone itself. But so you really uh, need that nutrition. But if you just if you start low and, and go slow and, and salt out the, with the water, uh, you should get good results. And my book, the reason I, I wrote the book is not only did I want to say where iodine came from and, and how it helped people, and not just individuals, but it to help hold cultures of people. Uh, but I wanted to give that people wrote to me o over the years and, uh, with their stories of, of what it fixed. And that was so helpful to me that I asked them permission to put their stories in the book. And, and I did. And, and so there, there's all stories about how people were helped uh, with iodine. Um, I'm going to ask you about the a hearing in a second. But before we go, so Right when you said um, Dr. Abrams, iodoral, I think the um, the internet would kind of got choppy, so I just wanted to reiterate the word. So it's iodoral, is that correct? I O D O R A L. Oh, okay. I O D O R A L. Okay. And people say it like you say it too. Um, and I'll add that to the show notes. Um, did you ever try to change your diet? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, for hypothyroid, if your hands are feeling cold, it's probably because your metabolism isn't doing well. So maybe you need to eat excess carbohydrates or you need to do X, Y, Z to your diet. Have you noticed with your clients or your people in your Yahoo groups or maybe diet has anything to do with it? Um, well, even the years that I was going to one doctor after another when I was falling asleep all the time, uh, the low carb diets w were better for the thyroid. And I'm not sure because of whether it's because something about the carbohydrates or something about the protein, but people generally do better. Their thyroids do better uh, w with low carb. That seems 
to uh, be a constant. I've never had anybody uh, argue about that. But they, uh, even the people that have that, you're not going to, you're not going to get iodine on a diet. I mean, you, you can have the best diet in the world, and it could make you can see a big change. But when you add iodine, you're just like adding to what you've already achieved with your diet. Right, right, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I have clients that eat less carbohydrate, and they feel a lot better. Their thyroid does better, and they're adding more fat. Um, so for nutrients, for hormones, but some of them, you know, they need a tipping point of something else, and. Um, I've just started including more of the iodine and I've noticed a few people are starting to feel better. So yes, and, and people say that uh, all the time that uh, they haven't sweat in 13 years. You know, they run, they run, they do, they're on the treadmill, but they, they just don't sweat and it, it takes them, you know, a long time to get even warm. But that, yeah, that, because that, the body, you think of what happens when th somebody's hypothyroid, they're low thyroid, it's ha like having a really inefficient furnace. Uh, right. You know, you're just taking very few calories to gain weight and you, you have to, you stay cold, just like, like a lo the lower animals stay, stay cold and to ha are able to have less calories to gain weight. So there's, there's a whole like reasoning in this. It's not just, oh, iodine is good for you. When you look at how it actually works, it shows you how, how you, your efficiency is improved so much. With, with iodine. You know, one other symptom you brought up in the book, but some men were talking about how their hearing improved uh, through iodine. Do you, can you talk a little bit about how it would affect your hearing? Well, a, a, an odd thing happened. Um, this is even after I wrote the book. A man contacted me from Egypt, and he had given it to his mother-in-law. And from I don't remember why he gave it to her, but he was like giving it to the whole family. And the mother-in-law was deaf in one ear, little things like rocks, as he described it, little pieces of bone or something came out of her ear. Wow. And I thought, well, you know, that and he was so excited about it. And so I went and I looked in the old literature and that had been recorded before. So because we're relearning all this from like a hundred years ago, it was great to have somebody like a couple of years ago report this this incident of his of his mother-in-law and so i'm thinking well that's this generation let's see if any more comes along and then an audiologist this was po posted on uh one of the facebook groups uh, so an audiologist ch chimed in and said nope that's absolutely impossible it can't happen you know because she didn't learn in audiology school but then somebody else chimed in and said no i had the little things fall out of my ear too. <laughs> so wow. and, and there's an actual medical name for them I don't, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. It's, you know, it has a million syllables. So to answer your question about hearing, yes, it, it, it can benefit hearing. Not all hearing, you know, I don't know anything about audiology. All I do know is that people going out of their way to tell me that something extraordinary happened. And they don't know that I've talked to other people that have always also said the same thing. And one of the things that's important about, because I, I know the diet you're using and how good it is for diabetes and uh, for your blood sugar, but... One of the things that iodine does is it seems to help diabetes a lot. There, I really? mean, there was some guy who contacted me early on, and he was a 280, 300-pound social worker from, from California, and he got off all his insulin, you know, just gradually uh, doing it. And then Dr. Fleshus, who's one of the iodine doctors, one of his patients uh, you know, came into the office. Her blood sugar was crazy. She had to go to the hospital. And then he told her when she got out, what, I want you to take the iodine every day and then take your insulin and you, you know, titrate according to what your blood sugar says. So then she came into the office, you know, a few weeks later, and he said, well, how much insulin are you taking? And he said, she said, well, I'm not taking any. Was I supposed to if my blood sugar was normal? This was one of those things that, you know, it isn't an easy fix. I'm not claiming that it's an easy fix, but sometimes diabetes and the pancreas because it's an organ that iodine particularly affects sometimes it is just an iodine deficiency there just like there's a sometimes there's a dietary deficiency or a parasite problem because i because of, of, of your background i wanted to mention uh the diabetic angle i know that some people start including some of the seaweed and i know that you're not a fan of it do you think you can talk a little bit about if we use the seaweed um, a long time ago for the iodine why can't we just you know go to like an asian market and buy those thick pieces of seaweed and add it to our broth for example that's a, 
a great question, and I, I, I wish I could do the same thing because where I live, I live sort of on a sandbar up in, in the New England area, okay. up, up Long Island, and um, I, I have seaweed everywhere. I mean, I just could like walk two minutes and get ten kinds of seaweed. Uh, you know, beautiful, tasty seaweed. But this is the problem with seaweed. I could have done that 30 years ago, and I would be fine. But since bromide and, and oil, the, you know, when there's oil spills, they have oil evaporators and dissolvers uh, in the water. So you have bromide in the water, you have fire retardants in the water, you have oil dispersants in the water. There's a, a whole lot of other chemicals in the water that they didn't have 30 years ago. And so you can, and arsenic for sure. It would be great to have seaweed because you get other nutrients at the same time, co-nutrients. But... Mm -hmm. You don't want to take the chance, and you also you never know how much uh, iodine is is in that. Also, as soon as you take the seaweed out of the water, the iodine just you know goes into the air. So that's no good. Okay, no, that but that's the main reason. You, you know, uh, no, it's not as concentrated. I mean, you may have almost no iodine in there, and you may have more arsenic than iodine. So, and and you may have more bromide in there. And, and one of the things Dr. Brownstein always says, he's a, a colleague of mine who's also been very helpful to me and to other people about uh, talking about seaweed is that you can make yourself worse. There are people that have taken, not, not fresh seaweed, but they've taken uh, seaweed kelp supplements from the health food store and ended up in the emergency room because they got arsenic poisoning. So, I mean, this is all recorded. Um, it's just, it's just not worth it. Or, you know, if you really love it and you, you do it a few times a year, you know, have seaweed that you like. If you go to a restaurant that has seaweed that, that you know really prepared well, you might try it. It's, it's, it's not going to kill you, certainly, but to ha to take it every day the way we take iodine as a supplement wouldn't be healthy. You know, let, let's talk a little bit about those kind of cofactors, the salt loading. So you brought up in the book, for example, selenium, vitamin C, uh, some of the B vitamins, magnesium, these may be beneficial to take while you're, you know, balancing out the iodine. But there was one section where you mentioned different iodine formulations. So, you know, I, I just want to make clear, you don't recommend all these different iodine formulations. So one that you brought up was, you know, you'd be wary of one that had tyrosine and selenium. So I don't want our listeners to now go and run to the store and buy like a concoction of the iodine. So can you talk a little bit about why you don't necessarily recommend that one? There's several um, iodine formulas out there. And everybody, of course, wants to approve on the one that's been working, the Lugol solution formula. Lugol's isn't a brand. It's a kind of formulation uh, to exact standards uh, that, you know, there are books and books and books have written. I mean, it got rid of lung disease in the, in the 19th century. Um, but there's something called nascent. There's a few others. You might get some help, but it, it's just it's just not reliable. Uh, people will say, oh, this is pure. No, it's not. Who says it's pure? I mean, the manufacturer says it's pure. <laughs> so uh, we just don't know anything about them. And, and I've talked to my you know, iodine literate colleagues about this, and, and they just shake their head too. Uh, if somebody's giving you nascent iodine, they don't really know what the risk is in giving that particular formulation in terms of result. If you're very, very sick and you're taking something that's iodine may be really helpful to you, uh, I w really wouldn't mess around with these, what we call mongrel iodines. And then what about people that have only partial thyroid or, you know, have done some surgery and they don't have as much, or if they're even hyperthyroid, do they, do, would you still recommend decent dosage of iodine for them daily? Yes, they, they need iodine uh, just as much as somebody uh, who, who doesn't have a thyroid. And um, if you're hyperthyroid, that, now that's when you, it would be best to really go to an iodine literate practitioner who knows uh, to give you, if you suddenly went hyper for for 99.999 percent of the people who get hyperthyroid are not on iodine. But if you are hyper, in in I have a book from Harvard in the 1950s or 60s in which they told how they used iodine for hyperthyroidism. So, but you have to, and there's a couple of other things that the iodine doctors use along with that. But I, I don't want to give that out, you know, without uh, somebody knowing that somebody's under the care of a doctor because yeah. hyper can just make you, you know, really yeah. jumpy and it is more serious than hypothyroidism. But it has been used. It obviously, it definitely has been used. 
iodine has been used for hyperthyroidism. What I'm hearing from you, and I know it's also in your book, but just, you know, in summation, that we all need iodine. We shouldn't really worry about excess iodine. Um, if anything, we are mostly all deficient. Uh, bromide is a definite reason. There is food that has bromide, but in general, it's not even from our food. So that just further, you know, necessitates that we need iodine for all the different organs in our bodies. Um, and especially with our um, hypothyroid going on, breast cancer increase. But we should also not just take iodine, but possibly use the cofactors like selenium, vitamin C, um, definitely the salt loading to help remove some of the bromide. But more than anything, um, the best ways to make sure we're doing this quote unquote right is to um, do that uh, testing, that 24 hour test, and then work with um, the iodine literate practitioners, which you brought up several times in the book and I'll put a link. Oh, and also don't, um, use iodized salt. So, uh, you know, definitely use a supplement that is, you know, like the iodoral or the Lugols and, you know, again, work with someone to make sure you're doing it the right way. Is that kind of a decent summation? Would you add something yes, or yes. modify it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think you, I, I wanted to mention one, one you know, of the huge list of things that uh, iodine helps for you. It, it also helps, you only need to be slightly iodine deficient, just like a slightly on the, on the low side in order to not be able to conceive on a menstrual, menstrual cycle. Because the body just will sh often shut down producing babies if, if, if the babies are, can't be iodine deficient. So we, on the Iodine Workshop Facebook group, they saved up all the pictures of all the babies that were born to women who had been having trouble conceiving. So I, I think that's just something that I, I wanted to mention above and beyond all the other things because it, it, it's it's a life changing for people. That's powerful. So would would you recommend pregnant women and nursing women to be uh, consuming this iodine as well? Oh yes, there, and what I, I should mention to that, and I, I think you may have written to me about that. Um, the doctors want if, if you're uh, pregnant. As soon as you find out you're pregnant, uh, they want you to take no more than 12 milligrams uh, of iodine. Uh, and, and that's not because your body can't use more than that, but it's because the doctors won't get sued uh, if anything happens to the baby for any other reason. But, you know, you can just st stay low until you nurse, and then it, it's 12 milligrams again while you're nursing. This is what the doctors have agreed on that's safe. And then after that, uh, you can go back to whatever amount of iodine you were taking be before you conceived. But do you agree with that uh, recommendation? Well, uh, I know there are people that, that have been taking, I mean, my niece was taking iodine for a long time before she had her second child. And so when she got pregnant, she just like kept on at that high dose. And, and, and the child is, is brilliant. I mean, it just the, the kid, the kid uh, really turned out very bright. So uh, the, the rules would have been no, go back to 12, but she decided right. that she didn't feel well or something if she wasn't taking the high amount. She, she really needs uh, a lot of iodine. I don't know why some people need more than others. And especially sometimes after you give birth, you even need more iodine. I'm not sure how that works. But. And you know what's interesting is in Asian cultures, um, especially in the Korean culture, so I don't know about all the Asian cultures, but the way that we are kind of healed back to normal right after having babies is seaweed soup. And so I don't know if it's back yonder, they knew that the iodine was so important, but my mom, and it's, it's even commonplace today is you just have bowls and bowls of seaweed soup after you're pregnant. And the, the thought was that it cleans your blood. And so they would tell us that. But what's interesting is in the American culture, like, so I started looking up, why am I eating this I, uh, seaweed soup, it's, you know, eating it over and over every day. Uh, I started seeing, you know, documents that say, oh, you should be careful with the seaweed soup because you can get excess iodine in your system. So it's, it's interesting that you're saying that, you know, how certain people may need iodine after they have babies, because in the Korean culture, the number one food they make you eat every single day, if not every meal, is seaweed soup. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> They probably have specific eyed, uh, seaweeds that they prefer one over another too. Right, right. You know, you mentioned how certain pregnant moms 
there's a risk that if they don't have enough iodine, it can cause mental retardation. You talked a little bit about that in the beginning. If you can talk a little bit about, yes. um, you know, the deficiency, if a pregnant woman has deficiencies, you know, what it can mean for the baby. And then secondly, should we be supplementing iodine for our children? Well, let me tell you about uh, a place in China. You pr probably remember when Marco, Marco Polo went to China many, many years ago, you know, centuries ago. And he saw some people there that were sort of small and um, not very bright and, and not able to raise animals well. The animals died. Well, the, the particular province, I wrote about this in my book, and I showed you a picture of this particular province where they started uh, giving iodine, uh, adding iodine to the, uh, to the irrigation dish, uh, ditches for the plants and for the animals. And what had happened is these people, compared to some other provinces in China, the children were very small and grew very slowly. The, the women that were having uh, stillbirths and miscarriages, and the animals were having stillbirths and miscarriages. I mean, it was... It, it, it was they were starving because like they couldn't it took as much trouble to raise an animal that died that it did the one that didn't die so it was very very hard on their economy and everything so through like the kennedy foundation and the kiwanis foundation these nonprofits, they decided to figure out a way now they didn't want to have iodized salt like uh, there's a reason for that but so what they did is they dripped potassium iodate which is a good form of iodine for this particular thing into their irrigation ditches and within a year yeah you know, the, the the animals started eating the plants the people started eating the plants the children grew five inches faster than they did the, the previous year that's how amazing wow. it was the women stopped having miscarriages the animals stopped having miscarriages and everybody got taller not the adults but you know it just <laughs> There's a huge growth spurt, and it, this is, uh, you know, when you think how mu how much do you think this would cost to to give this whole province, in which they put just they had a barrel, a 55 pound barrel that you would see on the street somewhere, they filled with potassium iodate and stick a hole in it and just let it drip into the water, and so how much do you think it cost to to get all these people? not having stillbirths, their animals living, their intelligence getting average, it costs like eight cents per person per year. And that's how important iodine was. I mean, if it costs much, much more than that, obviously it would be worth it. But this is really documented and we in this country don't see how, how completely challenged other people are like this. I mean, we have iodine deficiency, but not to the extent that these people do. Should we be supplementing with kids? Oh, yeah, that was the question about kids. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think kids are that toxic as, as we are. So uh, a lot of people are giving their kids iodine dosage and with, without the this, the companion nutrients until they get about 12 or something like that. But they don't just don't need uh, the amount of support that adults have because they haven't been uh, toxic as long that that seems to be the working i don't want to ever tell anybody to give it to their kids though a lot of people just they play games with their kids they'll, they'll get a, some lugol's iodine which is the liquid and put like a smiley face on their tummy or something like that a couple of times a week is a game to a toddler or something like that and so that th that will get through the skin enough will get through the skin of a toddler like that that it will help there is so much information about iodine and, you know, you you beautifully break down a timeline historically of how we used iodine for, you know, years and centuries. And But was it really just the wolf um, Chaikov assumption that has, you know, removed iodine from our, you know, medical literature? Like what happened when this is such a cheap, simple way to strengthen the body, and now we're all scared of overly consuming iodine. Is it because of the wolf checkoff? Is it solely because of the Yes, well, well, when you, well, one of the things that we're learning in our whole political situation, but it's also been that it predates this, our, our current situation because of influencers and leaders in medicine come along 
and people are just too afraid to say, but what about that? But what right. about that? Once it gets written in a textbook in a medical school by somebody who is, you know, with the NIH, you really have a hard time arguing and people think it's gospel. For example, I remember meeting a, a doctor socially and I, I don't know, he found out that I was interested in iodine. And he said something like, how much do you take? And I said, well, I'm taking 25 right now. And he said, no, no, you must mean 25 micrograms. He's like, told me I was taking milligrams. And, and I said, no, no, it, it's, micro, it's milligrams. And he said, no, you would be dead if you were taking 25 milligrams. And you would be, your shot, thyroid would be shut down. So he believed it. And I said, well, for a corpse, I must look really good to you. I mean, because I, I had been taking iodine for years by that time. But they, they absolutely believe it because that's just an axiom in medical school. Now, this was a, this was a doctor I met socially. I, you know, I don't have any doctors. The doctors I have, you know, have read my book and have it in their office. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't go to a doctor who personally who, who, who was so unknowledgeable about iodine because he's unknowledgeable about iodine. He's, you know, he doesn't know other fundamentally wrong things. But one of the things you asked, and I, it's a great question, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that, is how come iodine could have been around for 15,000 years like it was in, in, in Chile? You know, we found in the archaeological sites they had uh, iodine and, and seaweed huts where they 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 used it on their people and people traveled long distances to go to, to get the iodine and the seaweed medicine. So that's fifteen thousand years ago. And then throughout the years, I give this timeline, you know, through the Middle Ages, through the Egyptian times. It's in the Egyptian in, in the writings in the Egyptian writings, the the different um, ones that they have in museums and stuff like that. The medicine papyrus uh, have using specific seaweeds for breast cancer. So if you figure how many years ago that is, and then you work down from, say, uh, 100 BC to when iodine was, a, was used back and forth as, as seaweed, then it got discovered as an element. And when it was discovered as an element, it was considered a miracle. So that was in the 1800s, as I, as I mentioned. And then it became the universal nutrient. And then how could it have been the universal nutrient for 200 years if it took one guy to knock it off? The, the thing is, you had to say to Mr. Or, or, or to the doctors, well, how come for 200 years when people were taking this for tuberculosis and their lungs and all sorts of things and, 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 and breasts and were injecting it into the ovaries, how come it, it didn't kill them then and it was considered a, a cure or at least a, a treatment? He didn't care, you know, that it, it somehow... In spite of the evidence, that particular wolf chaikoff assumption, as I call it, it got, got ground. And if that can happen, it can happen to lots of other medical things. You have to be interested in the, in the, so, in the sort of sociology of medicine on how things get shaped and, and opinions get shaped. And that I totally agree with. I mean, just looking at how heart disease was, the saturated fats were labeled as the cause of heart disease. And the Ansel Keys um, seven country studies when he actually studied 22. So I think there's a lot of that. I just never realized it was also in the iodine literature as well. And so it was your book that really opened my eyes to that. And I think everyone that's listening should really get your book and read. I opened with which is that um, iodine deficiency isn't a myth that our iodine consumption has dropped 50% in the last uh, 30 plus years. And it's even dropped more in the last 10. That's the main thing. I mean, this isn't a myth that when you can actually measure, measure that at iodine going down in, in our diet at the same time, the cancers and the breast disease is going up. I mean, you can measure that in, in the National Institutes of Health. So th this is all documented stuff. This isn't, it'll take a while for it to get widely accepted, but it it will. I mean, it, it's just a matter of time because it's the truth and there's just cases after cases. But I, I thank you so much for it, uh, inviting me and I, uh, I hope your listeners will, will at least, you know, consider that iodine might, it's such a cheap change if you want to try something. Um, you know, it's like a do no harm thing. So it, it right. would be really great if, if people were open. Especially in our times right now, um, you know, what really motivates people is fear, right? And so one of the things I think that people are scared of taking excess 
iodine is that fear that we may be overdoing it and then affecting our thyroid adversely. And that's such a common, the thyroid being hypo is so common nowadays. So I think there's this essential fear that's causing people not to use the iodine. And so I hope with this discussion, it shares with people that there's no fear and that we should actually be taking a lot of iodine um, as we are trying to heal our bodies, especially when so many people struggle with hypothyroid. I was just going to say, uh, if you give iodine a very slow start, like you say, you take one drop a week or something like that, uh, it should have no fear. Um, and if you're taking one drop a week, you know, or you try putting it on your leg, anything you can do to just like get started and, and, and get a feel for it. Nothing catastrophic happens. But there is a group, uh, Iodine Workshop group on Facebook, and they, they use my book, they use Dr. Brownstein's book. And if you're having trouble with y your protocol or you have a question, if you, if, if you can take it with some other medicine or something like that, it's a good place to hang out with, to, you know, to find out and just you eavesdrop, see what they're talking about. Well, thank you so much okay. for your time. This has been incredibly valuable. Again, your book was very eye-opening. It's just another one of those stories where we have been, you know, misinformed, right? So where can people find you? Um, you know, do you work with clients at all? Like, uh, and where can people find your book? So if people read my book, you can catch me on Facebook. And uh, yeah, I, if you have quick questions, I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, my book is called The Iodine Crisis, What You Don't Know About Iodine Can Wreck Your Life. It's on Amazon. It's in a lot of libraries. Um, and, you know, you can just, just get it different places. I would get it on uh, Amazon because, well, they have the, uh, I have an audio book now that, that just came out uh, two weeks ago. And a lot of people have brain fog, so they're hesitant to read. But if they can listen to the book, and, and it's a readable book. I mean, I tried to make it for people with brain fog, and I tried to write it as a journalist that was talking to a friend who had you know, terrible things happening to her. I tried to make that, it, that kind of book. And you can see I tell stories, that, that some of the, the stories, that I found that other people had those stories, too about what it's like to be sick and try to impersonate a well. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. And I will you know, have this out and I will share all um, the resources in our show notes. And yeah, I think you're doing such great work. And I'm um, very, very appreciative of um, your book and just for you coming on here today. Oh, well, thank you, Judy. I've, I've enjoyed it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. For me personally, I've always recommended iodine to my clients, but I also had the fear that there may be too much excess iodine. And now I realize that may not be a truth. I hope that you try to figure out how much iodine you need. And maybe you get that 24 hour test or you work with an iodine literate practitioner. More than anything, I hope you realize how important iodine is and that we should be taking some every day. In the show notes, I'll also include a supplement that can go with some of the iodine and the iodoral that Lynn recommends. These will all be in the show notes, so make sure and check out the notes. Okay, guys, thanks for checking out this interview. If you found it helpful and you know that people need iodine, which is pretty much everyone, but please make sure to share this episode so that people can hear the truth about iodine and the deficiencies we have across the globe. Okay, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place to live and make sure to get a little bit of iodine. I will talk to you guys later. Take care. Bye.